Um, we're going to be uh, jumping into chapter 5 of Jonah. I'm just kidding. There's no chapter 5. Uh, there's chapter 4. Just testing you. Yeah, we're going to be uh, finishing up our series in the book of Jonah. Um, I, I, I wanted to look at a concept that I saw uh, over the course of this book. Um, before I get into that, I want to give you a little story about a vacation that my wife and I took a couple of years back. Uh, we have some friends who love to go to a dude ranch. Uh, it's, they, they love it so much that they decided this is where they go every single year for their anniversary. First week of June, they head to this dude ranch in Colorado where they ride on horseback through the mountains and dress up like cowboys and cowgirls and just have fun. Uh, and they've been doing this for like nine, ten years. Um, and they wanted to give us a gift, uh, so they uh, bought our way uh, after graduated seminary and went out there to go ride horseback with them, which is awesome because free vacation. Yes, please. Um, Four-star, five-star meals, uh, got a Wrangler that takes care of you, and you get to ride horseback in the mountains of Colorado. I mean, it's a pretty good deal. So when they're, they send you a form to fill out before you go there, the form says, we are not liable if you break your arm or if you lose a member of your body or if you die. You know, and I'm like, well, I have no idea what I'm signing up for, but the Lord's with me. So, uh, sure, fine. Then on that form, they ask, what's your, uh, what's your experience riding horses? And my wife's uh, dad plays polo, so she's got some experience. Um, and I had ridden a camel in the Jordan Desert for three hours, and that was the extent of my experience. So I said, none. So we get there, and we're getting ready, and they, get, we, they pick out their horses for the people, and, uh, and they get me, and they get me to the horse. I'm one of the last people to get on, and I'm, they have me on this old half-draft Clydesdale giant horse that probably came from a plow of an Amish person. So I'm like, okay, great. So I get on this thing, and I hop on, I throw my leg over the side of the saddle, and I don't even get my foot in the other stirrup before this horse starts spinning in circles. And I'm like, what is going on? I said I had no experience. And evidently, this horse had a sore that I aggravated. So as soon as they got him down, I got me off. And they're like, okay, we got a horse for you. I said, okay, sure. I'll just get one that I, that's not going to do that, please. Um, so they put me on this horse named Cody. And Cody is the horse they keep back for inexperienced children. Um <laughs> Which is great, because I had no idea what I was doing. And a 2,200-pound animal underneath you, is a, that's a force to be reckoned with. So I get on Cody, and I'm right. He's good. He's happy. He, he goes where you want him to go. Um, he also goes at his own pace. So um, everyone in front of me, they're driving, like, Toyotas and Hondas and, you know, uh, yeah, there's a couple Ferraris out there, and I'm riding behind everyone in a John Deere tractor. I mean, it will go where you want it to go. It's just going to go slowly. So I figure out what's how, how to ride a little bit. I get, get you know confidence underneath me, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm ready uh, to maybe switch horses because I'm, this is fun. It's great. I, I don't really like being 150 yards behind everyone kicking this horse trying to get him to go. They're like, good, good. I understand. You got it. You're, you're, you're figuring this thing out pretty well. We'll get you on a horse. Here's Rooster. It's like, awesome, great. Rooster's a beautiful horse. Uh, Rooster goes faster than Cody. Uh, Rooster does not have a park feature. Um, so he did not want to stay still. He just wanted to keep going. Um, so that was fun. I'm just, he's got an emergency brake, but it, it kind of slides a little bit. Like if you've ever been in a car, like it just keeps on wanting to go. Um, so we're going, we're having fun, we're doing trails, and then finally we're like, hey, we would, our, my Wrangler's like, hey, I got a trail we need to clear, um, I, you guys want to go, it's, uh, we haven't gone on it yet, you might find some elk sheds, some deer sheds, um, if you're interested, we're like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So we get in a group, we go, it's like three hours up to the start of where we need to start clearing this trail. So we get there, and then 15 trees later, um, there's a lot of trees down, my horse is done. He's just like, I'm done stopping and not moving. Um, so I keep on stopping them. And I don't know if you know a horse. When they're, when they're not doing what you want them to do, you're supposed to take them by the rein on one side, turn their head, kick that same side, and get them to spin around. Right? It just tells them, I'm in charge. You're not in charge. This is what we're doing. They don't like it. And they're like, okay, fine. 
So I'm doing that, and then he's just getting he's getting rammy. So I'm like, okay, well, tell my friend who's other horses having the same issue. I'm like, why don't we walk up the trail a little bit, and then we'll walk back so just to keep him busy. So we do. We walk up. We turn around. We come back down. We do it again, and then I go to turn my horse around, and he decides that he doesn't want to turn around. Uh, so I pull the rein a little bit, and then he neighs at me and pulls the rein like this. And I'm like, that's weird. Never had that happen before. So I try to pull again. And he jumps up on his back legs. And I'm like, this is a new experience. Um, and we're on the side of a mountain, right? Giant granite boulders, uh, death and pain below you if you fall off the, the horse. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's not right. Maybe I turn him around and I try to do it again. And he pulled again and jumped up again. And I said, all right, your way we're going. So we start walking off the trail. See, Rooster was done. He wanted to go home. Uh, he doesn't care if it was only an hour this way to get home. He wanted to go the extra three hours back the other way to go home. So as I'm walking off on this horse at a little bit of a slow trot, um, I turn to my friend Eric. I'm like, Eric, I, I need help. Go get Matt. I didn't want to yell or scream because I didn't want to startle this horse. Um, and he's like, okay. And I'm like, Eric, I need help. Go get Matt as I'm disappearing away from him. And this horse is starting to go. He wants to run, and I'm pulling back that brake, and I'm trying to slow him down, but not too much because I don't want to be thrown off this horse. And uh, so the Wrangler goes. He comes. He comes sprinting like some old Western and comes and stops the horse for me. And I'm like, Matt, I would like to switch horses with you. And he's like, <laughs> no, you can't do that. I said, well, why not? And he goes, well, my horse is worse than your horse. Um and I said, okay, so what, am I, what do I do? And he's like, you grab that horse by the face, you pull him, and you spin him around. I said, I don't think you understand. The last time I did that, he tried to throw me off. He said, no, grab up by the front of his face, pull his neck around, kick him, and spin him five times. I said, okay, fine. So I did. And I spun him around, and I did that, and the horse finally calmed down. Right? We went back. Um, good time. Great story. Uh, but that horse had a problem. That horse was lacking discipline. That horse did not have the discipline that it needed to do the job that it was purchased and trained to do. That horse was a danger. And this place brings in families sometimes where they put kids on horses. And if that, that horse wasn't disciplined well enough, it wouldn't have been some 30-odd you know, old man who's on top of that who has the wits about himself to hold on to a horse when he jumps off. could have been some kid or someone who's elderly. And they could have really got hurt. This horse was not disciplined. So today I want to talk to you about discipline. How does the Lord discipline his kids? Because his children are here for a mission, on an assignment. They're here for a purpose. We're here for a purpose. And we can do that in ways that are beneficial for people, and we can do that in ways that are harmful for people. And the question I want to ask and answer today is, how does the Lord discipline his kids. And I think we see that answer to that in the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah as a whole, and I want to look at the whole thing. No, there is no chapter 5 of Jonah. But the whole book of Jonah describes a picture of how God deals with his children. How God disciplines his kids. So we've been doing this. You guys should know this story by now. Uh, if not... You might want to go see the doctor. Uh, but Jonah, Jonah's just an interesting prophet. Jonah, son of Amittai. It's really translated that son of Amittai could be very well translated son of my faithfulness. This flittery, flappy dove is a description of Jonah, but he's the son of my faithfulness. So as we look through this today, I, got, I have four observations on God's discipline I want to look at and that application. That's kind of where we're going. So we have a five-point sermon, 
So hold on to your seats. Um, But the first thing I want to look at is that the discipline of the Lord, uh, the discipline of the Lord is restorative, not punitive. The discipline of the Lord is restorative, not punitive. And I think this is an important observation. Because this is not how we typically, when we're birthed into this world, when we start thinking about God, most people don't see God as someone who has their best interest in mind. They see him as this angry old person in the sky who just wants to steal all their fun. But that's not what God is about. God actually wants our best. And when he does discipline us, it's for our good, not because he's annoyed with us. You see, Jonah was a prophet. He was a successful prophet. He made predictions. They came about. He lived under the time of an evil, wicked king in northern Israel. He was a prophet from northern Israel. And there's not actually a whole lot of times of actually good kings in northern Israel when you read through Kings. But he was under Jeroboam II, who was a particularly wicked king. And he was called by God to do some mighty things. And God selected him, and he called him out, and he he sent him on a mission that God knew would be the best thing for Jonah, because God knew what was in Jonah's heart. Jonah, you got a problem with people. Jonah, you're thinking about yourself. Jonah, you're called to be my prophet and you're called to represent me, but you're not doing that very well. So Jonah, I want to send you somewhere to help you begin to change your outlook on life. So Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great wicked city, and go proclaim to them what I want you to proclaim to them. And what does Jonah do? He runs opposite direction. Do you know that God knew exactly what Jonah was going to do when he called Jonah to go do what Jonah was going to do? Do you know that God knew that Jonah eventually, after he rescued him with the fish, was going to be on a mountain somewhere sitting, sulking, depressed, because God was rescuing people, and that he was going to be mad, and he's going to be suicidal, and he's going to be all upset about what God was doing? That everything that happened in the book of Jonah, God knew was going to happen in Jonah's life? And he stepped in and he called him. Jonah, go. And as Jonah's running away, God knew this was going to happen. God's seeing this happen. God knows where he goes. And he goes down to Joppa, modern day Tel Aviv. And he hops on a a boat. And he gets down in that boat. And he sleeps in the bottom. And God throws, I mean it says he hurls in the Hebrew, a storm at him. He casts it over to him. And that storm's shaking up this boat. It's making grown, experienced sailors terrified. But Jonah's still asleep. Which means Jonah's either refusing to wake up, or Jonah's numbing the pain a little bit and putting himself asleep a little bit. Because he's wrestling within himself with what God wants him to do. And God sends that storm knowing that what was going to happen, that Jonah's going to get tossed out, and God has a fish already appointed to rescue this man when he is ready to repent. He engineers the circumstances to rescue Jonah, to bring him back and send him again back to where he wanted him to go. And God knew about Jonah's repentance. I'm sorry, Lord. You're so good. Your ways are great. I will do what I vowed to do. And he knew that Jonah was going to renege on that vow. Or not necessarily renege, but only partially fill it out. He knew Jonah was going to go to Nineveh and be very passive with his proclamation. I mean, because the text only says he walks in halfway into the town and just starts saying, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There's no mention of repent. You could be saved. Yahweh loves you. God's God's compassionate and He's gracious. He's slow to anger and He's abounding in steadfast love. He could rescue you. Jonah doesn't do that. You crazy people. (laughs) 
40 days, you're going down. Done my duty. I'm going to go sit and watch. And God knows about all of that. And God appoints, right? Chapter 4. He appoints a, a plant to come up as this object lesson. Give him shade. I mean, right after Jonah, right, and here's the point of the book, right? Ch- that verse 2, oh Lord, this is not what I said when I was yet in my country. That This is why I made haste to flee to charges, for I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. That's the point of the book. That is who God is. He's that way to the Ninevites. He's that way to Jonah. And then Jonah says, Now, therefore, O Lord, take my life from me. I don't want to live in a world where Ninevites get saved. I don't want to live in a world where people who I don't like, who say things I don't like, can have rescue. And God appoints a plant, gives him shade. Jonah changes his tune. He's like, This is awesome. I love this plant. It's the best plant in the world. Um, I think I'm going to name this plant Wilson. Uh, no, yeah, okay. Some of you get that. Um, and then God appointed a sun, a worm, sun, scorching heat, killed the plant, took away the comfort, and Jonah's right back where it was. And all the while, God's doing that for Jonah to help Jonah recognize what Jonah needs to recognize. Jonah, what are you concerned about? I'm concerned about people, Jonah. What are you concerned about? So God uses a storm in his life, proverbial wooden spoon. He uses an object lesson in a conversation. And God's purpose And all of that is to restore Jonah, to change his heart. See, my second observation is that God's goal and discipline is to change the heart. So often we get confused into thinking that the purpose of Christianity is to create good moral people. That's a byproduct. It's a natural outcome of someone who's been redeemed. They become to be moral people. Not immediately, and not fully until the Lord brings them back, but in truth and reality, they are holy because the Lord has made them holy. They are righteous because the Lord has made them righteous. But His purpose is not people who just do all these good things. His purpose is that people whose hearts are shaped into wanting the good things, desiring the good things, seeking the care of people and representing to the world who God is, having a heart that breaks over the things that the Lord's heart breaks over. God desired to change Jonah's perspective, so he had him go through all of these things to do that. And it worked. You want to know how I know it worked? Because the book of Jonah exists. Jonah wrote this book. He didn't hide any details. He didn't change the story to make himself look better. He wrote it. Warts and all. In fact, if anything, he probably made himself look worse. I mean, this is, this is considered satire by many. Because it's so crazy as to how this prophet acts. And Jonah finally came to a point to say, yeah, I was a fool. I was ignorant and brutish towards you. 
And if my foolish story in my life can show your great mercy and grace, I will write it out for you. So that people would see, taste and see that you are good. God's purpose is to change the heart. God desires to work in you to shift what needs to be shifted. We live in a broken world. God does not cause all things, but He does cause all things to be worked together for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. Right? But sometimes we get mistaken into thinking that as He's working all those things, all those things are being worked into good things that I'm experiencing as good. When I don't realize what's good for me is sometimes discipline. Sometimes hardship. Sometimes a cancer diagnosis is exactly what I need to understand what real life is about in abiding with the Lord. Sometimes a loss of a job helps me to understand that I can actually trust the Lord to be my provision when the money is not there in the bank account. Sometimes a difficult coworker or sibling is there to help me to understand what patience and grace and mercy is worked out in my life. And God can work all of those circumstances around to bring us to Himself. See, God's discipline is a revelation of His love for us. His discipline for us is a revelation of His love for us. Right? Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof, for the Lord reproves him He loves as a father in the son in whom He delights. You know, as a parent, if you don't discipline your kids, it's really just saying that you don't love them. Now, I'm not, obviously there are degrees. There is abuse and then there is discipline. You know what abuse stems from? Stopping behavior that's making me annoyed. You know what discipline stems from? I love this person so much that I know what this behavior is going to turn into and I don't want them to walk through the pain of life of carrying this action out in places that I'm not around. Right, the easy example is the kid running into the street. You stop that. Because they don't know any better. They don't have the concept of a 4,000 pound vehicle driving 35 miles an hour and hitting them. They don't get it. But a father or a mother who loves, loves, doesn't like disciplining their kids, but does it because they love them. And God is doing that to you. In fact, in Hebrews, it says, for it's discipline that you have to endure. That's what it says up there. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The fact that the Lord allows discipline into our life reveals that we are His. Finally, God's discipline is a, um, God's correction frees us to tell the story of God's grace. God's correction frees us to tell the story of God's grace. Right? He's working in and through every aspect of our life to change, shape, move, put us into positions where we can proclaim his goodness and grace. Right, as I mentioned earlier, one of, the, one of the biggest arguments for Jonah getting it is the existence of the book of Jonah. And out of all the prophets in the Old Testament, there's only like three or four mentioned in all of the Gospels. Jonah is one of them. And Jonah, the book of Jonah, is 
a book that is explicitly describing the gospel and how Jesus leapt overboard in the storm and the brokenness of life for our rescue. Like Jonah jumped out of the ship and the people were rescued and they, it says they, they, they started worshiping Yahweh. Jesus hopped out of the boat to his peril. And like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days. And Jesus rose again and went to the people who were far off from him. Violent, ignorant, did not know their left hand from their right hand, and he went to go proclaim salvation to them. And Jonah's willingness to humiliate himself and put his story out there is now a revelation of the grace and the mercy of God. Oftentimes we want to come in church, right? We want to look the part. We want people to see us as good Christians, even though we know what's going on in here. Or we know the things that we're struggling with. Or we know that we were just screaming at our kids as we were driving to church. We get in the parking lot. All right, everyone behave. Can't let anyone know that we're having issues in our, in our house. So we put these masks on, right? We don't want people to see us. Because the shame would be too great to bear. And one of the most difficult hurdles for people to overcome is the shame that they bear in order to coming into an abiding life with Jesus. And it doesn't under, until we understand that God can actually take that shame, that He's already purchased it, that because of my identity in Him, I don't have to carry it. That I can be broken in a church and it's okay as long as I'm resting in the Lord. And part of me trusting Him is trusting Him with my reputation. That this thing that I've been trying to uphold for my whole life, I don't need to carry anymore. Because it's His. And this is a struggle for all of us. Pastors too. Amen. So we're born into this world feeling like we have to uphold our identity. Knowing something's wrong, but trying to make sure that people don't know something's wrong. And we fool ourselves. And to thinking we have to uphold those images. And so often we miss the opportunity to see God do amazing things in our life through opening up our story to people. Right? Most people in here have grown up under parents who did not discipline them for their good. As far as the statistics are concerned, a lot of us had abusive parents or family members or people who were in positions of leadership over us. And we carry the shame of what was going on in our life. And those people were acting out of the shame that was in their life. And so we want to just hold it together. I got, I got good parents. They weren't perfect. For a while, they, were, they will admit this. They were operating out of shame. As a pastor, my kids, being kids, were considered he wasn't doing his job right because his kids were acting out of control. 
So they disciplined us because of what other people thought about what they, how good of the job they were doing. And after move after move after unhealthy church after unhealthy church, for me, so I'm done with this. I don't want to carry this shame anymore. I don't know what to do with it. Started drinking, smoking, partying. And it wasn't until the Lord came into my life with some people who showed grace and mercy that I finally understood it and got it. And I'm still constantly reminding myself of it. And it's through the sharing of that story after the Lord works in my life, I end up meeting a pastor's kid in Pennsylvania who's gone even further down the line than I ever went. And God uses my story to help him come to know the Lord. And his life's changed. I got multiple people who I've just shared my story with. That's most evangelism. evangelism. You don't need to know all the answers. Just got to tell about what God did in your life. And again, I'm not promoting myself as some whatever. That's the Lord's work, not me. But being willing to open up yourself to say, this is where I was, this is what the Lord did, and you look at me, you think I'm this good kid, you have no idea what my past was. But I am a new person because Jesus may be a new person. And it's like three weeks ago, I just found out this guy who was an atheist came to know the Lord. Apparently I led him to the Lord. I don't remember it. And God has that opportunity for you if you let him. If you walk through his discipline in your life, the conviction that you're feeling, if you embrace it, you hold on to him, you walk with him, he begins to shape and change you. He begins to work in you. He makes your story into one of the most explicit stories of the gospel in the world. So what do we do with all this, right? The grace of God, God's discipline is restorative, not punitive. His goal is to change our heart. When he disciplines us, it reveals his love for us. It frees us to tell the story of his grace. I just, I just want you to change the way you think about discipline. God is not trying to withhold things from you to stop your joy. God is trying to give you rest in fullness of joy. You can experience that rest here and now, today. Whether you've never known Jesus before or you've been walking with him for a long time. It's just as simple as trusting him. That psalm I read this morning, Psalm 73. My soul was embittered when I was pricked to the heart. I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. God does not push you away when you do wrong things. He is with you in the middle of it. How many of you would like to be, uh, have a closer walk with Jesus? How would you like to be closer to Jesus? Raise your hand. How would you like to be closer to Jesus? Oh, no, keep them up. I want to write down, see how many... <laughs> I want to see how many unbelievers we have here. Is Jesus ever distant from you? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I've placed my spirit in you as a guarantee. No matter if your phone goes off in the middle of church... Or you're up late at night looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. Or you're screaming at your kids. Or you're stealing from your boss. Or you're speeding down the highway. 
which is only legal on 95 when everyone else is going the same speed limit. <laughs> God is with you in all of that. He doesn't disown you. Glory. He doesn't like it. He knows it's not good for you. And if he's engineering circumstances in your life to get you to stop doing the thing that is destructive for your life, it is because he loves you. Amen. So just simply admit and relent and trust him. He's good. He's faithful. He's just. We're going to sing a song here now. It's called The Way. Most of us know this. It's just a simple song, right? Most of the good theological songs in this world are simple. Trust and obey for there's no other way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. I believe it. So what we have to remind ourselves of. Jesus is the way. Trust Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Rest in Jesus. Find your identity in Jesus. Find your reputation in Jesus. Be willing to be a fool for Jesus. Trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jonah. I thank you for the fool, uh, the ignorant person that he was. I thank you for his willingness to describe that which describes all of us, Lord. Lord, we need you. Shape our hearts, Lord. Remove our shame. And work through our stories so, Lord, you may bring people who are far off, who do not know you, to know you. In Jesus' name.